Supersymmetry is a cornerstone of string theory. It's what allows string theory to explain all the things, not just the forces of nature, but also the building blocks. And it was originally developed in the context of string theory in the 1970s, but it quickly became popular throughout all of theoretical physics because the concept of supersymmetry uh, enabled the solution to some really thorny problems in our standard model of particle physics, like why is gravity so weak? How do the forces of nature unify at high energy? And why does the Higgs boson have the mass that it does? String theory, or sorry, supersymmetry is a proposed symmetry in nature between the fermions, which are the building blocks, and the bosons, which are the forces in nature. And it says that they're, they're really connected, that they're really uh, related to each other in a very cool and complicated mathematical way. Supersymmetry says that for every fermion, there is a partner over in the boson family. And for every boson, there is a partner over in the fermion family. Now, you might expect uh, that, this, that the partner particles, which are called super partners because supersymmetry, it's going to get a little rough here with the jargon, the, the simplest form of supersymmetry possible says that for every fermion, say you pick it a fermion like the electron, that it has a super partner particle, which is called a sparticle. Sparticle has the exact same mass as the electron, the exact same charge, but a different spin. So the simplest version of supersymmetry says, that, okay, you've got an electron with this mass, this charge, and a spin one half. You should see a boson with the exact same mass, with the exact same charge, <clears throat> excuse me, but spin one. Well, we don't. There is no such thing as a boson that has the mass of the electron, that has the charge of the electron, but spin one. That particle just doesn't exist. There's no, and that's true for every particle, every fermion, every boson. When you make the simplest possible match, it just doesn't exist. This makes us think that this supersymmetry is broken in our universe. That this supersymmetry only appears at very high energies, like the energies inside of a particle collider. And that when things cool down and we have the normal everyday energies, the super partners, the sparticles, gain an incredibly high mass, which makes them just not appear in the normal everyday universe. They're, they're too high mass. If you made it, it would instantly decay into something else, and so you just never see it around. So the way to test supersymmetry, which is more of a family of ideas rather than one idea, it's like there's a bunch of supersymmetric models, each one outlining different predictions for what these particles, the super partner particles ought to be. And there's different models with different predictions for, for these particles of what their masses and properties might be like. But even though, uh, we don't know exactly which supersymmetry theory is right, if any of them, that doesn't, hasn't stopped theorists from making names for all the particles. So you might encounter some of these names, so I want to tell you what it means. If you have a fermion and you want to know what its super partner particle is, its sparticle is, you just add an S to it. So the electron becomes the selectron. The neutrino becomes the sneutrino. Uh, the top quark becomes the stop quark. And if you have a boson over here and you want to find out what its sparticle is, you add an eno to the end. So if you have a photon, its super partner particle, super partner particle is the photino. If you have a gluon, its partner is the gluino. 
My two favorite ones, by the way, and by favorite, I mean I hate them. The super partner particle of the up quark is the sub quark. Sub quark, how's it going? And the super partner particle of the W boson is the Wino boson. I just said that out loud. So the game of experiments of experimental physics is to try to find some evidence of supersymmetry to find a Wino boson somewhere in our particle colliders. The simplest methods uh, or the simplest models of supersymmetry, the ones that were the most natural, that like had just the right combination of, of masses and energies to, say, give the Higgs boson the mass that it does, was, these were expected to be found in the Large Hadron Collider. And they weren't. We've been running the Large Hadron Collider for a few years. We've found zero evidence for supersymmetry. Over the course of a few years, entire classes of models of supersymmetry have just been wiped off the map. Is supersymmetry totally dead? No, because there's more complicated models that put those particles, that superpartner particles, outside the range of current detection capabilities. But people are starting to get a little bit worried because the simplest ones, the most natural ones, the most elegant ones have just been wiped out. What does this mean for string theory? It's not a direct test of string theory. This is instead testing supersymmetry, but string theory needs supersymmetry to get the job done. And so if we don't find any positive evidence for supersymmetry, it makes string theory that much harder to buy. And that's where we are today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm still on this series of exploring the nature of string theory. Next week, I'm going to talk about something very interesting called the land escape tune in next week uh, but in the meantime why don't you go to patreon.com slash pm sutter that's p is in paul m is in matthew sutter keep these shows going really appreciate it and you can like share subscribe do all the youtube stuff and go out there and find your sparticle <laughs>